We're continuing with DNA replication. Uh, we already introduced uh, the overview of it, and now what we're going to do is start to look at the details and the, the proteins involved in replication. So what you're going to need to get out of this is a, a list of the names of proteins with their jobs and the order in which they work and do, and do those jobs. So double-stranded DNA held together with hydrogen bonds. What's going to happen is that Along the DNA, there are regions that are called origins of replication. Now, each chromosome is incredibly long right, in eukaryotic cells. In prokaryotic cells, they're, they're much smaller. Uh, many prokaryotic cells, bacteria, have only a single origin of replication. Some have more than one, and then they can do this process faster, uh, but many of them only have a, a single origin. Eukaryotes have many origins of replication. That's because the information is, is vast. Right? It, it's like an incredibly long book. And if, if you were asked to copy word for word, letter by letter, um, the entire book by hand, uh, starting on page one to page, you know, a Harry Potter book to page 700 something, it would take you a very long time to do that. If you had help and someone else could do it at the same time, starting at a different point in the book, that would make it go a little faster. If 10 people could help, starting at 10 different places within the book, each just copying a segment, again, the whole entire book would be copied in a short period of time. And now we're copying DNA in the cell from one chromosome to two. And if we just started at one end to try to copy it, it would take much too long. So the origin of replication is the place where replication begins. In the drawings that you'll see uh, in the book, many other videos online, and in this particular uh, lecture, Often, we only see one origin replication, so people often misinterpret that and don't fully explain it um, and tell you that there are more than one. Okay, So there'll be multiple origins all happening at the, the same time to really copy the whole chromosome uh, in a reasonable period of time for the cell to divide. But for simplicity's sake, we're only, when we first discuss the process, focusing on one of them. So this one origin of replication we have the binding of that enzyme called helicase. So helicase, if you remember, I mentioned uh, in a previous uh, lecture, is going to break the hydrogen bond between the nucleotide. So it breaks the hydrogen bonds. Now the thing is, at this origin of replication, where it's pulled apart, it then creates, as you can see here, the two DNA strands, the single strands, are being pulled apart. But that's happening in opposite directions. So what we have here is a, a single area where the two strands are pulled apart. That's called a replication fork. So even at a single origin of replication, you have two forks, one on this side, one on this side, of this area. In this particular area here, where the whole, you know, there's no hydrogen bonding here, that area is called a replication bubble. And you can see uh, there are the places on the, the course uh, website where I have some uh, photos taken with an electron microscope that shows actual DNA. Um, and you can see multiple um, bubbles, replication bubbles. Um, that are within a, a chromosome. So you have to see replication is occurring at multiple sites along a chromosome all at the same time. Right? Again, for simplicity's sake, you know, I'll just add in this here, you know, it is typically a bi-directional process. So once it starts here at the origin, helicases come in and actually work in both directions. Again, we're gonna just focus on one replication fork and the proteins that occur there. All the same things would be happening in the other direction and there would be other origins. To keep it simple, we're just going to focus now on this just one replication fork. So we have this helicase is pulling the strands apart. The thing is, if you remember the problem, that the strands would like to come back together again. A would bind with T, G would bind with C. But we don't want to let that happen. So coming in here, behind the helicase are going to be proteins we called SSBPs. Okay, we have them over there. Uh, they're called the single strand. binding proteins. And they pretty much do 
what the name says. They bind to single strands of DNA and they keep them single so they don't hydrogen bond with the other strand. That's it. Okay, they're temporarily there. They're temporarily binding to those strands until they're removed when the new DNA is put in place. So when the new DNA comes in, they're kicked out. But for now, we need them there. So helicase pulls the strands apart. Single strand binding proteins keep them apart. And now before we add to what's going on directly here the, at the next step of the replication fork, we have to talk about another problem. Right? So the other problem is the DNA. The DNA is double-stranded, but it's not ladder-like. Remember, the DNA is a helix. So I kind of drew this wavy-looking structure uh, like this because the two strands are woven around one another right, in a very specific way. But the thing is, as the two strands now are being pulled apart, what's going to happen is further down, in this case, you know, upstream here, right, from the direction it's going to move, there's going to be additional pressure put on that coil. And it's going to create something, a problem, called supercoiling. So supercoiling is a problem that can now occur because the strands are being pulled apart and this area is going to be compressed. So we have to have a way of avoiding supercoiling, which would ultimately cause the DNA to almost tangle around itself and knot up. So an enzyme comes in here, not at the replication fork, forward of it. This enzyme is called topoisomerase. And there are different kinds of topoisomerase. We're not going to go into uh, details now here in this particular course uh, of the different types of topoisomerase. In general, uh, one type of topoisomerase will cut a single strand of DNA. Another type will cut both strands of DNA. But here we're just going to kind of go with a, a more overview you know, of the idea. What does topoisomerase do? It temporarily, it's kind of like having a rope wrapped around another rope and you can't kind of untangle them. So you get a pair of scissors and you actually cut the rope and then allow it to untangle. So it'd be a lot, a lot easier to do that. The thing is, you're never going to be able to put it back together again, at least not the way it was before. It's not going to be exactly the same. But here we're breaking a chemical bond. We're breaking a phosphodiester bond, a bond between two nucleotides. With energy, that bond can be repaired and be no different than it was before. So there's no scar. There's nothing that changes or permanently alters the DNA in the area where it's cut. It cuts the DNA, allows the other strand to unwind to relieve the supercoiling, and then it joins the single strand DNA back to itself. Right, so there's no permanent break in the DNA. So an enzyme called topoisomerase relieves the supercoiling before it really happens. Uh, and it allows then the rest of this process to continue and move forward. Without it, uh, this process would be stopped ultimately because the DNA would become tangled. So here the case comes in at the origin, pulls the strands apart, single strand binding proteins keep them apart. Topoisomerase is working ahead of them now preventing them from uncoiling it so much that they tangle uh, the DNA up in something called supercoiling. Uh, and now we're going to need to start to read the DNA and, and make some of the pieces. The thing is, we need this enzyme up here, an enzyme called DNA polymerase. That's going to come in, and like in our earlier model of looking at semi-conservative replication, it's going to read a template, it's going to read an A, and bring in a T nucleotide. It's going to read a G, bring in a C nucleotide, and it's going to then build the new DNA. But there are a couple problems. The thing is, DNA polymerase has a couple rules. One of them is that it can't work from scratch. Right? So you have to explain what that means. It can't work or it can't build, because that's its job, that's its, its work, uh, from scratch. And what do, what do we mean by that? Right. The DNA polymerase can't work from or build from scratch. Well, that means it can't take like a GTP and a CTP and just join them together to pump down two nucleotides and then a third one and a fourth one. DNA polymerase can only make an already existing strand longer. But if you go back to our original idea here, our original model, right? A, T, C, C, A, G, C, like this. We pulled the two strands apart. Now we have a single strand. That single strand is the template. And what we need to do is start to build the new DNA and then add in the new nucleotide. So we need to add a T here, right? 
The problem is what I'm saying is that this enzyme can't just do that. What this enzyme needs is sort of something here. It needs a three prime OH group that it can build off of. And then it can attach that T nucleotide to the three prime OH. And then it can continue to work having a new three prime N, new three prime N, and it can build right the new, the new strand. If it doesn't have this piece here, it can't do its work. And right now at this moment in time, this piece doesn't exist. There's nothing there. There's nothing to build off of. So that's a problem. So before we could get into the DNA polymerase, before we can talk about what happens here, we have to address this. How do we get one of those, essentially? So what we need is, is another enzyme. So here, along the strands, along both strands, replacing some of the single strand binding proteins is going to be an enzyme that will work on both strands called primase. And so what the primase is going to do is it's going to build a little piece of RNA. So it's going to build a short RNA. So it's an enzyme that makes a short RNA section called a primer along the single stranded DNA. All right, so attached to the single-stranded DNA, it's going to make a little primer. So actually, the way it would work technically, uh, if we're going to redo this properly, is it wouldn't just be attached, though, to nothing. It would actually be attached here. You know, So again, there's U in RNA, not, um, not T, like this. O, H, P, like that. So now we have a 3' OH group that the DNA enzyme can use. Um, and so it can actually do its job. But there's sort of a problem that we have a little piece of RNA stuck to the DNA. Uh, but that's something we're going to have to address later on. Okay, so We're going to have to come back to that. But at this point in time, that is the next step. So find the origin, pull the DNA apart. That's helicase. Single strand binding proteins keep it apart temporarily. Topoisomerase prevents it from overcoiling or supercoiling downstream. And then a primase enzyme comes in and it makes along the DNA a little short piece of RNA. Now, again, wh why can it do that? It's because it can build from scratch. I said the DNA polymerase cannot. The RNA, so the primase is a type of RNA polymerase. And it can build from scratch. So we can just take an A nucleotide and a, okay, a U, say UTP, in this case, and join them together with a GTP and so on. And it can make a little short section of RNA. There's no DNA enzyme that can do that. So the RNA enzyme does that and makes a little piece of RNA. So it pairs up and then it provides the, the OH. So now what we can have is the DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase can come in. The first thing it needs is an open three prime end. And so what, what it will do is then join to that a nucleotide, the correct nucleotide with the base pairing. So if it's a C, it's going to put in the G. If it's a C, it's going to put in another G. A, now because it's DNA, it will have a T, you know, G, C, and so on. It'll keep building in a five prime to three prime direction. So there's a couple things we need to know about DNA polymerase. So the DNA polymerase needs a primer, which is a little piece of RNA. So uh, DNA polymerase needs a primer. Uh, it only reads the template three prime to five prime. So it has a direction in which it reads. Think about how you read. You, you don't just read in any direction, right to left, left to right, back to front. You read in one particular way. Say you have a page of a book, you start in the upper left-hand corner, and then you move across the page to the right. Then you go down a line, 
and typically read that way. Some other languages read in different ways, uh, and that's the case, say, for DNA. It's like a different language, and it's read in a very specific way, and it's read in this particular way, 3 to 5 prime. That's the way the information makes sense to this enzyme. Because the strands are anti-parallel, it builds DNA, and that's a single strand of DNA. It builds a single strand of DNA, 5 prime to 3 prime. Right? So that's what it's doing here, building a new piece of DNA, 5 prime to 3 prime. And then that's what's going to happen here. So from the primer, we'll get the new DNA built. The thing is, we're going to have to address this um, now a little bit more in, in the next uh, lecture, is now we have two strands. But remember, the two strands are anti-parallel. So that means while the DNA polymerase can read the strand that's going 3 to 5, and it can build the DNA 5 to 3 on the other strand, if it were to try to be moving in the same direction, it wouldn't make sense. It would be like it's reading it backwards. So it would have to, and it would have to make the DNA backwards, and it, it can't do either of those things. It can't read it backwards. It can't make it backwards. It has to only work in a particular way. So that means it would have to sort of be working in this direction, making the DNA this way, but now we have a problem. There's something else going on here. There are other, other proteins it's not quite pulled apart, so... Um, what happens? You know, in, in bacteria, they have some mechanisms where you kind of pull apart the strands and then copy you know, one strand at a time. But here, both strands are going to be copied at the exact same time, yet they're running in opposite directions. So that leads us to the problem of what are called leading and lagging strands. And so that's, gonna, that's usually uh, a stumbling block for a lot of people. They get very confused about it. So we're going to dedicate a whole uh, short lecture to just leading and lagging strands and what happens with that. So for right now, you just have the, the, the overview of the first several enzymes and the beginning of the process. We don't have the end of the process yet. All right, so we'll have to go to the next lecture to look at how it, how it ends. We'll look at leading and lagging strands and we'll take that uh, to the end of replication.